Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Telespark and our special adult night program. Uh, we'll close the doors over there in a bit, uh, unless you want to disco in here and party in here as well. Uh, my name is Alan Dyer. I'll be presiding over our very special presentations in our feature gallery here this evening. We have two really great speakers to tell you a very wonderful personal story of from heart attack to heart transplant. I'll introduce uh, Scott, our second speaker, uh, a little later on. But uh, to start off with, I'm going to introduce Dr. Paul Fedak. His credentials are just over here, so I won't go through all those. But I will mention that Paul is a cardiac surgeon and scientist at the University of Calgary. Dr. Fedak is committed to the innovation and translation of new surgical therapies for patients with advanced heart disease. He's pioneered novel sternal closure techniques using kryptonite. So you don't want to be Superman if you're a patient of Dr. Fedak. Kryptonite adhesive and is currently developing stem cell and tissue engineering approaches to treat heart failure. He leads the surgical heart failure program at the Libin Cardiovascular Institute at Alberta and implants mechanical pump technology for patients with advanced heart failure. He is widely recognized as a knowledge and opinion leader in cardiac surgery and participates on the medical advisory boards of numerous medical device companies. He was recently named Top 40 Under 40 in Calgary by Avenue Magazine. So please join me in welcoming to Telespark and our adult night program tonight, Dr. Paul Fida. Okay, well thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak uh, tonight. This is a, a pretty special event. I didn't realize it was going to be so big, now I'm nervous. Um, what I'm going to talk to you uh, tonight about is our mechanical heart program and how we're using this um, so somewhat newer technology to support patients with advanced heart failure. And um, I'd like to uh, review that with you tonight and we have a special guest uh, which is a, a patient of ours. Um, who's going to come up and speak after and tell a little bit from his side so the story what uh, what this technology is all about. So the, the technology it's called a LVAT or left ventricular assist device and essentially what we do with this technology is we bypass flow um, blood away from the pumping chamber um, into the pump and then the pump pumps it back into the body and we use this in patients who have really sick hearts. So if your pumping chamber is essentially not working at all, this type of mechanical support therapy can keep you going. It can keep you alive until a number of things can happen. One is maybe your heart can recover. Maybe your heart will not recover and you'll need a heart transplant or maybe you'll stay on this device. So we're gonna talk about those different things tonight. But essentially this is um, what it looks like, the pump flow coming out and re being redirected back into the body. The um, pumps that were originally that came out um, were outside of the body and they weren't portable and they weren't implantable. And that was a real issue for patients. So you can imagine if you want to try to survive on this device and have any kind of quality of life, ultimately you would need some kind of implantable device. And we're now at the stage where we do have implantable heart technology and we use it. And this is an example of what it can look like in both an x-ray and in a patient. So you can imagine that's implanted inside the patient. And then there's a drive line so that it has to be powered. There's an electrical cable that's actually comes out of your body and then hooks up to a battery pack and you wear that battery pack and then you can go sort of on your way with it. So as I mentioned, there's really three options to use these uh, pumps. So one is what we call a bridge. So it's a bridge either to getting someone to a, successfully to a transplant and then they can live with their transplanted heart. Or in some special scenarios, we try to recover the heart and maybe it just needs a period of rest and then it will uh, recover and we can remove the mechanical support device. And lastly, there's something called destination therapy. And this is somewhat newer. Um, in destination therapy, we would implant the pump and just leave it there, and you um, live with the pump forever. And that's for patients who um, are not eligible for a transplant in most cases. So we performed at the Libman Institute the uh, first implantable LVAD in Al Alberta. Uh, this was a patient of ours, and um, some of those people uh, in the picture are here today. And one thing to recognize, and it was pointed out to me right before this talk, 
is that this uh, therapy, yes, it's a surgical therapy, a surgeon is involved in implanting it, but it takes an enormous amount of personnel, expertise, resources, money, time, and energy. And it really is a, 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 um, a program. It's not just one person uh, dealing with this. There are so many issues involved in these patients and finding the right patients and managing them both before, optimizing them before the surgery, getting them through the surgical stage, through the intensive care unit, getting them educated about how to live on this device, um, the psychological and mental issues that you're going to face, the medications that are involved, getting them to eventually to their heart transplant. It's an enormous amount of people involved. And lots of those people are, um, are here today and you may get a chance to speak with some of them. So I feel very privileged to speak on their behalf about this program. Um, you're going to meet later uh, a very special guy named Scott, also known as the Tin Man. And he'll, he'll explain that a little bit more to you. But I got to know Scott under some very dire circumstances when I got called, uh, I think it was fairly late in the evening, about a patient, a, a young, healthy, 28-year-old guy who came in with a massive heart attack, pretty unusual. But he essentially wiped out his pumping chamber. It wasn't really working. It was on the maximal amount of, of medications and everything. We threw everything we could at him. His heart was dying and failing, and we had to make a decision about what to do. At the time, our program was still relatively new, and uh, we had some uh, older technology. Uh, but we applied that technology, and we applied one of these heart pumps uh, in Scott, and we were able to successfully resuscitate him and get him better on the device and successfully get him to a heart transplant. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Now the type of technology that we used for Scott at the time was called a PDAD, so it's actually outside the body. Most of these devices that we have now we insert inside the body, they're implantable. This one was actually outside, so the pump, and you can actually see the blood swirling around in him, uh, so it's actually, I, I'm, we'll have to find out what he thinks, but I can imagine it would be quite horrifying to see your circulation sort of outside your body swirling around. But this is what the pump looks like down on, on the bottom. And you're really not supposed to leave the hospital on that device. Um, you're, it's really supposed to sort of stay in bed and wait for your heart transplant. But Scott um, was a young guy and he liked sports and uh, we, he encouraged us that he would go home with his device and wait for his heart transplant. And with a lot of um, special help and careful follow-up with um, our VAD co coordinator Anita and uh, the cardiologists involved, we were able to successfully get him home. And then one day I got a video sent to me. He went from tin man to tin cup, so four months after his heart attack, this is the video he sent me. and. I couldn't believe it. This guy is golfing on this device. Um, that, you're not supposed to do that. Um, but he did. And what worried me the most is when I told him that he shouldn't do that, he said, well, winter's coming soon, and if I don't get my heart transplanted, I'm putting skates on that thing and playing hockey. And it's obviously my job. If something goes wrong with this thing, I've got to try to figure out how to fix it. So you can see he's got his, this big pack with him and um, uh, providing the power to his device. And uh, it's a very big, bulky thing, and um, we have better technology now, but it did work for him. So the devices are getting better, and they're getting smaller all the time. So this one here uh, was one of the early ones. We, we haven't used this one in Alberta, but when I did my training in Toronto, we uh, did use this device. It, this thing is enormous, and um, we, there, there's a lot of patients that we can't use it on. They're just too small. So you have to be a pretty big guy in, in most cases to accept this type of a pump. It's super heavy. Then it's evolved. This one we have in Calgary right now is called the HeartMate 2, and um, it's a lot smaller. This is a great device. There are people who have gone years and years on this device, living a pretty normal quality of life, so it's an excellent device. There's a difference, too, with the newer devices. Many of them are continuous flow devices. So this old device here, it was actually a pusher plate, and, and it, it gave you pulsatile flow. This one here now is just a spinning device, so it actually doesn't give you a normal circulation because you continuous flow, so you don't have a pulse anymore. So you have to be very careful if somebody's sleeping that you yeah. can't measure a blood pressure and then they don't have a pulse. So the um, pumps have evolved as well. There's now a newer one called the Heartware pump. You can see how small this one is, and it's attached to the apex of the heart here, and the, the flow goes back to the aorta and back to the patient. So they are getting smaller and uh, easier to implant and easier to use. And the nice thing, and you can see this is the battery pack uh, over here that this patient has with the HeartMate 2 device that we have in Calgary. 
and he's able to travel and, and do things and can probably golf a lot more easily with that device. So that is um, a bridge to transplant, how we use it to get people to transplantation. Bridge to recovery is also something that we do. This was an example of a patient uh, in Toronto who had an unusual situation where sometimes after a pregnancy you can develop heart failure um, in an otherwise healthy person. And she was supported on one of those big devices, probably we could only get it in because she was um, uh, postpartum um, and there was room to put it. But that device supported her for some time and in fact her heart recovered and we were able to remove that device and she actually did quite well. Sort of an unusual situation but goes to show you that you know, without that device I don't, I don't think she would have survived. We do have a, a temporary device that's even easier to put in. You don't have to open anybody's chest. Um, it's a, a smaller procedure and we can use this particular device, um, which is quite innovative, for patients who just need some temporary support in a situation where we don't have a lot of time to place a device. This one's called the Impella. You can see how small it is, it sort of fit in, in your hand. And it goes in the aorta and we put it across the aortic valve into the pumping chamber. And it basically spins and sucks the blood out of the pumping chamber back into the aorta across the valve. This is an example of how we uh, place this device now. Is we um, make an incision uh, over the artery just under the uh, clavicle or collarbone. We put an artificial, so an artificial tube to the artery. Then we place a wire through that and snake the wire sort of like a train on a, on a track over here with x-ray guidance down into the heart. And then what we can do is slide the device along that wire down into the heart and get it to where we want it to go. And you can see how the device gets placed here into the heart. We remove that wire and then we position it in place and then blood is sucked through this and back into the aorta across the valve and um, you can sustain the patient on that. And we've done that many times. The nice thing for that, for uh, temporary support, is that you can easily remove that when the patient recovers and we can get patients up on their feet and walking um, uh, with that therapy. And the last one to talk about is what's called destination therapy. And destination therapy has largely come about because we just don't have enough hearts to transplant all the patients who may need them. So we need other options for them. And the technology is not perfect. These patients are prone to, they can have device failures, they can develop strokes, they can get infections from these pumps, they can have bleeding problems because they need to be on blood thinners. So it's not perfect, it's getting better, but heart transplant still is the gold standard for these patients. And we just don't have enough heart, so it's something to think about is organ donation. And um, uh, just to note that the Canadian Transplant Games will be in Calgary uh, coming up this summer, something that maybe everyone can participate in. I want to talk just a little bit about uh, some of the work that I'm doing in my lab and many other people at uh, uh, the Lipman Institute are involved in. And that's the, the issue of regenerative medicine. So, yes, mechanical heart pump technology is fantastic. We can implant these pumps, we can save lives. Um, in some cases, patients can live on them for a number of years. But ultimately, the ultimate goal is to try to recover hearts. And there may be ways to do that with regenerative type therapy, stem cells, tissue engineering. And that's what I'm trying to focus on uh, in my uh, program. Although I'm implanting uh, pump technology, I really would like to find a way to use a biologic solution to help these patients. And one of these may be something called cell transplantation. So because we don't have enough donor organs to do a full organ transplant on everyone, what if we could take cells from your own body, stem cells, cells from your bloodstream or your bone marrow, harvest them, and then inject them back into your heart where they could regenerate into new heart cells and then we can actually fix just the muscle component of your heart because if you think about it in many of these cases their valves are okay the blood vessels may be okay and it's just the muscle that's not working and maybe if we could regenerate that we could recover some of these hearts so we're working on that this is an example of say for example taking a muscle biopsy from somewhere else in your body we can take that biopsy into the laboratory we can extract the cells we can isolate them and we can make them grow and divide into dishes, um, into the millions or billions. And then we can take those into surgery and inject them directly into your heart. And that is being done. Um, there are clinical trials and it does show some promise. What we think is that these cells may actually, um, when they're injected into, uh, into your heart, they will actually do survive and they sometimes can regenerate into new muscle cells or we find also that they can um, deliver 
growth factors and other protective factors that help heal the heart and, and make it work better. So we're trying to understand that process better. The other thing is that cell transplantation might not be enough. So people are looking at, can we actually create new tissue? Can we create a new piece of muscle and then implant it into the heart to try to save these hearts? And what we believe is that using nature's own biology, which is this matrix, this material that all your cells are glued together with, if we could extract that and use that, we might be able to tissue engineer a new muscle. And there's a really interesting uh, set of studies that uh, was performed by Doris Taylor. Um, and what she did was she took some of these mouse hearts and she put some soaps and detergents in, into them, basically got the, these detergents to circulate through the heart. And she was able to extract out all the cells and leave this matrix, this glue, this skeleton that holds the heart together. And you can see that here in the picture that uh, you sort of see the blood gets removed, the cells get removed, and you're left with this whitish skeleton of a heart with no living cells in it. And then what she did was very interesting. She took stem cells and then she re-injected those stem cells into that skeleton of a heart. And essentially what she did was repopulate it. She put cells back in and rebuilt the heart on a scaffold, essentially. And then when she gave it an artificial circulation, lo and behold, she was actually able to get that whole heart to beat. And it didn't, it wasn't a strong contraction, but it was beating like, like a real heart. So maybe we don't have enough human donor organs, but maybe we can engineer organs at some point with your own stem cells or engineer your own tissue, uh, that could work. We're working on something right now. There's um, a product that comes from the pig intestine, and it's actually that glue, that matrix that is within the layers of the intestine. And we're trying to use this. This is now available, and surgeons have been implanting this in, in for various um, applications. It's extremely strong. And it may be the right platform where your own cells might want to populate it and create new tissue. So we're working with that in the lab somewhat. And we've been uh, taking uh, these heart attack areas and removing the scar and then cutting it away and then replacing that scar with some of this material in the hopes that it will regenerate into some new muscle or in fact help overall heart function. And when we've done that, uh, we've seen some interesting results where uh, the heart does seem to heal around it and there's significant tissue ingrowth and there's areas that look like there's new muscle formation. We need to understand this process better. It's not good enough yet to regenerate a heart, but it provides a building block, a platform that we can build on. And we may get to a point where we can do something like this and actually put stem cells on a scaffold like that and get it to beat synchronously in culture and if we can get to a point where we've got something like this and we can take that into the operating room and, and implant it, we might be able to um, get away from just using mechanical hearts and getting away from transplant altogether and actually restoring normal function in some of these hearts. So it's a ways off, there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done uh, with this, but it's exciting technology and I was um, uh, really pleased that I've got an opportunity to share that with you today and I'm even more pleased to have an opportunity to see Scott here today and I look forward to listening to uh, what he has to tell us about his experiences with this technology. Thank you very much. Our, our next speaker tonight is someone we've had the pleasure of working with. And uh, the exhibit is upstairs in the Being Human Gallery of Scott's VAD. Uh, so please take it in tonight. Uh, our speaker, next speaker, is Scott Goulet. For Scott, life was a battery operated. Life was battery operated for almost four months after suffering a heart attack after a ball hockey game. Scott was placed on life support. The left side of his side of his heart destroyed, as we heard. Enter the ventricular assist device. It helps weak or damaged hearts pump blood to the rest of the body by implanting Scott with a VAD. Doctors bought him time to wait for a transplant. With the support of the doctors from the Libman Institute, uh, Scott was discharged from the hospital while on his VAD, as we saw, playing golf, terminate, terming himself the Tin Man. He was determined to play hockey again when he only had a heart. In August 2008, Scott got his wish. He received a heart transplant, and within three months, he was back to work and training for the World Transplant Games. 
Uh, he began playing hockey again in 2009. So to tell you his personal story, please welcome to the stage, Scott Willett. Good evening. Uh, as you all know, I'm Scott Ouellette, uh, I guess the Tin Man. Uh, that term was kind of coined by my friends up in Red Deer, uh, mocking me that I needed a heart, and well, it kind of stuck. Uh, a little bit about my journey, how I got to where I am today. Um, I had no idea I had heart problems. I just all of a sudden had a heart attack. Even till the second that they put me under to put me on stars, I didn't even know what it was. What it was. Huh. I uh, woke up four or five days later with a lovely little heart beating on the outside of my, my body. Huh. I really didn't know what it was until I was told that it was a ventricular assist device and I was going to need a heart transplant. It was uh, quite a trying experience to figure out you know, what exactly a heart, tra a heart transplant was. I had no idea if I was going to be able to do any of the things I did before, uh, especially playing hockey, golfing, uh, all the things that I've come to love and do. Uh, the machine was quite an interesting being when I first was introduced to it. It was a big box beside my bed, uh, quite larger than the little machine that you see me dragging around, which is apparently what they start out on to get the right settings so your heart actually uh, agrees with what the machine is doing. Uh, after about a week, uh, a lovely nurse by the name of Anita was forcing me out of bed and making me stand up and do all the things I really didn't want to do with a broken sternum and uh, a machine running my heart. But it was for the better good of, of my health. Uh, at about, uh, I believe, 41 days, uh, the day before my 29th birthday, I was released to my parents' house here in Calgary and able to go home with uh, what we called him Batty, chugging along with me. Uh, it took a little bit for my wife to get used to the sound of a, a, a tick every time that my heart beated in the bedroom constantly and never ever did it go quiet. <laughs> it's amazing how you got used to this kind of noise while you slept, not even realizing it was there. Uh, it was probably, uh, my guess would be about day 60 when uh, I got the idea that I could golf. Uh, it was my idea. The doctors had no idea that I was going to do that. I tested it out on the driving range before I actually took it to a golf course. I did run it by the doctors and they went, really? And I went, yep. And they went, okay, just remember, you pull that cord out, you're not here anymore. And I went, gotcha. I ended up playing, God, it had to be about 10 rounds on that machine. Uh, the video that you've seen was, uh, I believe it was August 1st, which was about 15 days before I received my transplant. And I'm pretty sure I shot under 90 that day. <laughs> uh, the machine was a, a wonderful thing for me. It was a, a life or death situation that I was in. Uh, Dr. Fedak went out on a limb and uh, convinced the other doctors, my family, that this was the right thing to do and this was going to be the best thing for me. And uh, standing here today, he definitely made the right decision. On the machine, I was able to get strong. I was able to get healthy. Uh, as far as anyone knew, without me pushing around the machine, I was as healthy as anyone else out there. Which also led me to, on the night of April 15th, getting the call for a heart transplant. I was healthy enough to go into that transplant and bounce right back the next day. Within 24 hours of my transplant, I was awake. I was sitting up. Oh wait, I wasn't sitting up, I was on a breathing tube, but I was awake and on no beat of a machine to be found. It was uh, the first night I actually got my own room in the University of Edmonton. I actually had to turn on the radio because the ticking was, just wasn't there. <laughs> it was 
oddly too quiet. Uh, it's, it's really nothing that you don't understand unless you've been there. The only thing that I can hope for is that people realize that technology like this is what saves people like me. I didn't ask for any of this to happen. I didn't want any of this to happen. But I wouldn't trade this experience for a world. It's made me the kind of person I am today. And there, I've got hundreds and hundreds of people to thank for it. Uh, Dr. Fedak for taking the chance and doing such graceful work putting the machine in. All the doctors and nurses and paramedics and everyone in the hospital system that got me to where I was. Uh, Anita for being there 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 113 days of my life. Uh, without her, me and my family wouldn't have been able to cope. Uh, my parents, just for letting me and Amy squat in their house for three months while we had nowhere to go, either the hospital or their house, and they let us live there. Uh, so nice to us. The things my father did, it, he went up to Red Deer and grabbed my recliner from my house in Red Deer so I was more comfortable. And it's little things like that you just don't realize. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Wang and his team at the University of Edmonton, they did an amazing job with my transplant. We had complications, they got through it, I got through it, and I stand here today. Uh, my transplant team that I see now just once a year, <laughs> they guide me through everything I've been through, all my medication, all my checkups, my appointments, uh, keeping tabs on me, making sure I'm doing all the right things. Uh, most importantly, my wife. She, uh, she wasn't my wife when this all started. Hmm. She stood through it all. <sighs> and uh, I can't thank her enough. The only way I thank her is waking up every morning. I really don't have much else to say other than, uh, I guess, most importantly, my donor. All I know is her name was Kimberly. She was generous enough to donate her organs in uh, the worst possible time of her, of her family's life. And I'll, I'll forever be grateful. Thank you all for coming here tonight. I hope you get to check out the exhibit. It's, uh, a little piece of me that you can take away with you. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing that I've been through and I owe so many people my life. And please consider organ donation. It saves me, it saves hundreds of people that you'll see actually competing at the games in July here in Calgary. Uh, have a great night and thank you very much. <laughs>